1900. This is uh, Mary B. Roberts interviewing Mr. Jack J. Higgins, H-I-G-G-I-N-S, of Blackwell, Oklahoma. This is um, September the 13th, 1972. Mr. Higgins has many credits here. Uh, past President, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Club, American Legion, past Master of the Masonic Lodge, um, Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, was one time a Lieutenant Colonel. Um, there are so many credits, I think I'll just start with the interview. Uh, Mr. Higgins, would you give us the name of your parents, the Genealogical Society, is interested in getting the name of the father and the mother, then the lady that you married. My father's name was Jack J. Higgins, the same as mine, and my mother's name was Frances Higgins, and they, I was uh, born in Cali County, Kansas, of which they were residents. I uh, came to Blackwell in 1935 and met a third generation of one of the old timers in this county, uh, Mr. Bob Welch, who took a claim up in the Dilworth area. My mother-in-law was born on this claim in 1900. Her name is Mabel uh, Welch McCulley, and I married her oldest daughter, Lenore McCulley, which would have been the third generation. The, the uh, Welch family uh, have been, uh, w were very prominent in the early days in this county, and two brothers took claims right across from each other, M Mr. Bob Welch, which is my wife's grandmother, and Mr. John Welch, and which later moved in and made their homes in Blackwell. Um, uh, which one was it that made uh, the run? And... Uh, came in on the, uh, taking the, uh, I suppose, uh, was it a, a lot or a farm? Or well, most Mr. John Welch and Mr. Bob Welch both came in together and took claims right next to each other, at, uh, and so they were uh, right, uh, right in this county at that time and have been here ever since. Both families uh, had many children, and, and uh, most yeah. of them stayed in this county. Now, that was a Cherokee Strip run of 1893? That is correct, from, uh, from uh, our Kansas City and the state line in Kansas is where they started their run. Uh, are you, uh, uh, do you have some of the family stories that have been passed down on the run and the day of the run? Oh, not really. I have heard many stories and heard them talk and heard my family talk and, of course, heard my mother-in-law talk, Mrs. Uh, uh, McCulley, which I mentioned before, and uh, told of many stories and the hardships that they had when they moved on to the farm, and uh, the thing that they first lived in was just a little one-room shack, and how they were looking uh, for something for fuel to burn with, and they found a neighbor who had some coal, and uh, they were able to go over with a sack and bring back a little coal, and how the snow drifted through the cracks in the house of the night and when they woke up in the morning with heavy comforts on them while the snow fell off of the comforts down around their neck was a rather a rude awakening and a few stories of this type. However, I, I really am not in a position to, to tell these stories like they could. Oh. Well, um, any of the personal incidents are our family stories. We would like to have them if, as you think of them. Uh, in the meantime, tell us something about... Uh, uh, the early schools, the early history, and perhaps your school. Well, of course, I went to country school up in, in uh, Kansas, and uh, we didn't have any buses in those days, and I know I had to walk about two miles to my country school, and uh, it was uh, all eighth grades. Uh, I think we had some 40-some students and one teacher. Uh, uh, we got along real fine. However, I was uh, asked to make this interview more to tell a story of our historical society, which we're 
organizing here in, uh, <coughs> uh, pardon me, uh, but uh, yes, I was born and raised on a farm. The, um, uh, do you recall any particular uh, thing that uh, <coughs> influenced you perhaps more than any other incident or person? <coughs> All right, I believe my, my uh, question was particularly about you and your early experience in schools and so on. Well, of course, I, I guess I was like all young lads who had just started school, but uh, uh, I know when I first started school, I think one of the most uh, outstanding experiences I had, uh, my mother had uh, dressed me at that time in a little sailor suit, which she thought was very, very cute, with short legs on it, and my first day at school, and I got over to school, and all the rest of the boys were wearing overalls and blue shirts. And I was never as embarrassed in my life as I was over that little white sailor suit. And when I got home from school that evening, I told my mother that if I didn't, couldn't get a pair of overalls and a blue shirt like the rest of the boys were going wearing, and I wasn't going back to school. <laughs> you were going to be a dropout right there, were you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was a potential dropout. <laughs> uh, do you have any other family stories or days of your army life or something personally about you, Mr. Higgins, that I might uh, induce you to tell us? Well, I, uh, of course, spent <coughs> quite a little bit in World War II. I was, uh, went into service in, in 19, or in the National Guard in 1939, and uh, then I went on active duty uh, in the early part of uh, the 40s, and uh, was off, got off in, in off active duty in 1946. And um, uh, most of my experience was, of course, in different different stations here in the, in the states and and went overseas and went into combat as an infantryman and I would by the way I my unit was the 80th infantry division and I was in General Patton's army and I had the privilege of meeting General Patton at one time and uh, well it was his privilege it was my chagrin <laughs> he uh, he thought probably I was one of the crummiest looking soldiers he'd ever seen and told me so, <laughs> very definitely. He told me so. We uh, during the Battle of Bulge, and I we had of yes, we had been a very about language when he expressed himself. about 16 days in the lines without any relief of anything, and we were we looked terrible. I mean, and we were going into a rest area, and uh, uh, we happened to meet him on his jeep, and he wheeled his jeep to a stop, and wanted to know who was in charge, and I told him that I was and gave him the norm, uh, the, all the military courtesies that I was capable of at that time. And he told me how crummy I thought I looked and how crummy my whole unit looked and they were filthy and uh, he gave us so many m minutes or so many hours to get to a quartermaster shower and he wanted everyone dressed in a brand new uniform all shaved and bathed and report back to him at a certain point at a certain time and then he'd see what he's going to do with us. Well, he wasn't there at that time. This was his way of telling us that not to let any of these boys go to bed or rest until after they'd all cleaned up and shaved and bathed. It was a little different approach than, <laughs> than uh, most people would have done, but uh, by the day we, the next day he did come to our unit and we got a unit citation for our actions during the bulls, see? So we, well, I don't think he recognized us the second day. <laughs> there were two sides to the gentleman anyway then, wasn't yeah. there? <laughs> Uh, by the way, this is a side note uh, by the interviewer, Mary Roberts, but I was expressly told not to refer to this gentleman as Lieutenant Colonel. However, he wears that title. Oh, yes, I'm strictly a civilian. Uh, I was in the service only during the time of uh, war times, and uh, I did stay in reserve and was recalled during the Korean War, and so I have had two sieges of it, but mostly I'm, I'm just a civilian, and, and when... I was required to go, I went, and probably would again. Uh, 
I believe that uh, his chief interest right now seems to be his, uh, this uh, historical society that is budding and blooming and growing here in K County. Um, I would like very much for him to tell us uh, something of uh, their organization, what they're doing. I believe they even have a new muse museum on foot here. Would you tell us something of this and how it started and how you're taking off? Well, of course, we uh, feel maybe that we are going a little slow, but uh, in early spring, uh, I, have, I, am, I love museums, and I, I, I am somewhat of a history buff, uh, and I love to early day history, and particularly those areas of which I'm familiar with, as, as the people are here and as they've gone through, the, heard the different stories from the different people. And in May of 1972, we had a meeting of a town hall type meeting and we, uh, I say we because there was several of us who had gotten together and thought we should have a museum or a historical group or something in our community. And we wrote letters to all the organizations in our city and also we had the news media who had various stories and we had a meeting at the American Legion, and by the way, that meeting was on May the 23rd of 1972 is when we had this first meeting. No one was in charge. No one knew exactly what we were going to do. We just wanted to start a historical society. Um, I believe that uh, I neglected to state that among the other credits that, Ms. that uh, Mr. Higgins has is president of this new group. Am I right? Well, I might say how this happened uh, wasn't really... Uh, but I, I go back to this first meeting we had in May the 23rd, and I had been with a, uh, another gentleman, Mr. Dan McClung, had gotten this meeting together, and then Dan couldn't be there that night, and I had to take charge and, and, uh, and run the meeting and tell him what we were there for and what should be done. Well, out of that meeting, there were five people appointed by this group to to go out and to find out what it was going to do, ha take to organize a society, uh, to write articles of incorporation, to uh, write the bylaws, uh, to come up and come back within 60 days with a, a, a complete outline of what needed to be due and to include completed bylaws. And uh, so on that group was, of course, uh, 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 Miss Alpha Skirving uh, Alpha Skirving Berger, who uh, helped us a great deal, and there was Mr. Dan McClung, a local attorney, uh, Mr. Charles Hollapeter, one of our uh, farmers uh, uh, from this area, and Mr. Lyman Knapp, another rural farmer, and Mr. Oral DeCamp. And we had the next meeting on July the 14th, 1972, and we came back then and with our recommendations of what we thought we needed to do, we needed to write and become uh, incorporated to the state so we'd become a nonprofit organization. We had gotten uh, the necessary material for this. We came back with our bylaws uh, 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 of what we th thought should be recommended as the bylaws to start with and to the number that we needed on the board of directors. And we'd also went so far to appoint a nominating committee and had the, and we nominated the uh, board that night. And uh, uh, strange it may seem, uh, practically all of the things that we recommended the, the large group did uh, buy. And so we started off and on uh, with the new uh, new organization, you say July the 14th. We got our Articles of Incorporation back on August the 3rd of this year of 1972, and uh, w by the work of many of them, not myself, I was a president of, of elected on this for a one-year term, but the group we've had working has been outstanding. We went to the city, and they have allowed us to use the electrical park pavilion here, and I use the word electric park pavilion because that was the old name. They Most of them did say it's a pavilion. And we did get some monies from some organizations to buy material to remodel the inside of it. I might state at this time that we moved our lumber and our materials into the 
into this uh, uh, place to start work on uh, the 11th of this month of September 1972. We have a carpenter who has uh, come and donated his time to do all the remodeling. We have painters who come and said, we, if you'll buy the material, we'll do all the painting for you. And we're hoping that by, oh, by the 1st of January, why we'll be able to have a museum and starting to open it. Many, many, many people have come to us and are offering, oh, I just had an offer just today, this 13th, of a lady who, who come and told me that she had, and let me tell you about this, I think this is great. It's the first piano that was ever in Kay County and it uh, belongs to a family that brought this in on a covered wagon from Illinois, and it was the first, be the first piano, and, we, and they will give it to the museum. And then we found some, oh, uh, some old lunch boxes. I remember where the old lunch boxes are round tin that we used to carry when we went to school. Some people remember that. And so we're starting to get a great many things, uh, people who come in and brought things in for strip. I had a lady who come in just last week and it is a cooking pot that her mother brought when they settled their first claim here and this is the <coughs> a part of the Cannon family and it's an old cast iron pot and it was the only cooking utensil she had for many many days after she got here and and by the way I already have that in my possession and I think this is real fine <coughs> well you people have done so much in such a short while this is almost unbelievable um, how are you <coughs> how are you funding this we're funding this by selling memberships we have several memberships of course we have a student membership which is a dollar a year this is anyone who is attending school can get an active membership is five dollars a year and then of course we have a uh, what we call a uh, a co contributing member, which some of our business is giving us to a business is $50 a year. An organizational membership is uh, $50 a year, like of some organization who wants to belong as an organization. We have lifetime memberships, too, for $100 if anyone wants it. And then we have also, we have benefactors and patrons, and, and we, uh, we, uh, we we, we, ha we think we got a membership for anything anybody wants to give from a dollar on up. And uh, this was the reason we needed to get incorporated as a nonprofit organization so that this became a, and we do have that already completed. So uh, we, and by the way, at the fair, which is going on right now in Blackwell, we have a booth there. We have a, an old, old, old time steam engine like they used at thrashing. And it is an operation, it is fired up, and the man is there running it, and every time we sell a membership, whoever sells it gets to blow the whistle. And not many people, <coughs> it's all amazing of how many people, young people particularly, have never heard a steam whistle. And they just can't understand it. It's one of the most, one of the largest attractions that we have at our fair is this old steam engine. It's in working order, it's really running. What a wonderful project. About how many memberships now do you figure that you might have? We're someplace, uh, I think the last count I had was 102. We started out with this first, uh, for at this first meeting, I think we got 40, uh, 41 members, and then we started at that time with just whatever they wanted to give to while we was trying to get things together and until we established a dues structure. And uh, then we've sold quite a number to fair. And we're, we're close to 100 members at the present time. We, it's not enough. We need at least, uh, we, we need at least two or three we're more. Oh yes, we're just starting. And uh, of course, some of us are impatient. We'd like to get off a little faster, but we have a, we, uh, it takes time, but we hope that the, by the 1st of June, or when the, I, we always say mo next Memorial Day is our target that we want to have a grand opening and have open house and have a museum so that the people in this community and traveling public can come to our area to see our history. Uh, we were talking in the car as we came this morning. Um, I believe September 16th was the date of that run in 1893, so you're not far from a very historic date. No, that's correct. That's the reason we've always, uh, one of the reasons our fair is established kind of during the week it, it is because uh, I think you go way back that this was kind of a, a, a reunion for the old timers is the way it really started. And mm -hmm. 
fact of the matter, some people wonder why we have our Kate County Fair as late in the year as we do, but we try to run it together because of the mm -hmm. early day, but September the 16th. And if you'll notice, our Kate County Fair is stays with these dates when most of the fairs every place else are all finished. But we, uh, we, and that's the reason we try to have our old settlers reunion at that time too. And and we have quite a number of them here today. And tomorrow, of course, the 14th of this September this year is our old settlers day. And and you'd be surprised how many people here before statehood. You know, our statehood wasn't until 1907, and so if you were in this area prior to 1907, you're an old settler. <laughs> um, I believe that uh, you have a most interesting name for your group here. I was taken by that. Tell us how you came by it. Well, <laughs> we named our uh, historical society the Top of Oklahoma Historical Society. And we were fishing around for a name and uh, uh, wondering about what we could use. And some lady at the first meeting we had come up with the top of Oklahoma. I'm sorry that I cannot give credit to that, to that lady because I don't remember. I'm, we, I think we'll find out. But uh, we think that probably it was Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Jerry Reams. And we think that's who gave it. In fact, matter that, but I, I don't know. I haven't authenticated that yet. Mm -hmm. And then when we had our board meeting, we liked its name. We hung with it. And when we took it back to the main group, why they they bought it too. So that's the way we. It's the top of Oklahoma, and we are the top of Oklahoma. I think it's interesting to have such individualistic things as that, and it's uh, very appealing. And another thing is it designate you in any historical society anywhere because you'll never find another one like that. Uh, what are some of your future plans for it other than the museum? Are you planning to collect some of the memorabilia and so on from individuals like these tapes oh, yes. and so on? Yes, well, this living legend, of course, we want to carry that on as a part of our, of our area here, and we have uh, so many because of the early day history of this that we can we think we can probably put give something that may be unique in the, in the state of Oklahoma is because these are people or within the some a lot of second generation are still living and we want to get many many stories from these people and uh, just like my mother-in-law who is a second generation and uh, she was born on this claim and uh, we we think she will be able to give us many many things on uh, on this type we do have a committee particularly Appointed for this purpose, mm -hmm. and in, it's in our bylaws and uh, as a as a permanent mm -hmm. part of uh, one of our directed uh, one of our directed committees is the uh, is the Living Legend Committee, mm -hmm. and uh, so we expect to have. And the fact of the matter, we're looking now for uh, for a rec for a uh, recorder that uh, we hope someone will come along, you know, and say, "Gee, you ought to have one in your s museum." And we say, we sure have. I point you at the committee one to go raise the money and purchase it. <laughs> yeah, I see the, this real fine one you have here today. I won't mention the name of it since I don't think it was made in the United <laughs> States, but that's all right. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it, you'll find that it, the, it reproduces very well. Uh, when we have completed the review, I want you to hear the, when I want you to hear the way the tones come back. And it really is very good in that usually. Uh, I would like some stories or incidents of Blackwell. Uh, of course, the storm, we think about that. I believe you have between eight and 10,000 population here. Uh, but I notice that your background has Chamber of Commerce, so I know I'm safe on asking this question. Well, of course, I, ha I came to Blackwell in 1937. I was came to Kate uh, County in 1935, but I was down at Tonkwall, and I have been active in civic works uh, in Blackwell uh, since I've been here. I, I, uh, I like Blackwell. Uh, I've left here at, at three different times, and I'll always come back because I think it's a real fine town, and nothing makes a fine town except in the people. I mean, this is, uh, you can say about incidents in our town we've had good things and we've had some that weren't so good and I expect many many people will tell you about tornadoes we've had in the past but uh, we we do live in a fine community and I'd like to bring this up uh, people who talk about the storms they always talk about Oklahoma and their tornadoes do you know mm -hmm. where Tornado Alley. 
in Tornado Alley. There's tornadoes in every state in the Union. I mean, not only here, and we rank ninth from the top. So there's eight more states has more tornadoes than we are. And by the way, if you want to name names, Texas is first. So if you, that's, if you want to talk about Tornado Alley, but I don't like to talk about these things because uh, I think that the, the, the thing that I have that's made me more impressed with Blackwell and anything is the attitude of the people and their building. I mean, uh, uh, we have uh, new churches uh, that have been commit completed and are being completed in practically every denomination. And uh, this, I think, the one incident that talking about churches that I think ought to be brought up and more people ought to talk about in you know, during the Korean War and our local guard uh, group, which is an artillery unit, had to go to war. And at that time, the, uh, a group of people in, in Blackwell and the churches got together. And every day at 11 o'clock, they blew their fire whistle and also the whistle at the power plant. And everyone stopped for a moment of prayer for our people who had gone into Korean War. Now, uh, I think this can be authenticated. I've searched and searched, and I think it be authenticated. But even with our National Guard group boys going, and they being a combat unit, we know of no death that happened in our community from combat action during the Korean War. And I have to, by being a religious person, think that uh, this town has something unique on it. And uh, I, I'd rather talk about things like this this community has done when the banks stopped their business people on the street would stop and pray for a minute during a busy day and and uh, cars would pull over to one side and now this to me makes a, an outstanding community um, that uh, I had never heard this about the moment of prayer uh, but I should think that that would have lifted the morale of the boys over there too don't you you bet, because I was in the service at that time, and I knew that 11 o'clock, our time, that my community was praying for me. Oh, that's wonderful. I've never heard of it, but I think that's a splendid thing. Um, uh, you were speaking about the storms. Uh, our comeback when we were in California was always, uh, uh, yes, we have tornadoes. Uh, how about your earthquake? When was your last one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's a good comeback to them, too. I, because I, I think we have so many positive things to talk about, and I don't like to discuss negative things. Uh, I, get a, I, I can find enough of those accidentally right. without looking for them. That's correct. Um, uh, tell us something about your schools, and uh, are you having any uh, problems or anything such as as some of us are having in our other places? Well, of course, this is another thing. Uh, the schools in, in Blackwell, I think, are outstanding. As far as, uh, as, as the plants are concerned, we have all new schools. Our high school, now our junior high is not new, but it was it been built since my time in, mm -hmm. in uh, Blackwell. All of our grade schools are new, and I think that our Board of Education has done a terrific job in getting... Uh, uh, school people in here, our teachers and our, our uh, superintendent of schools and our principals, and we have built one of the finest school systems, and I think the best barometer is that is to look at the people who have gone on from here and gone on to the very best of colleges from Harvard and uh, OU and all the rest of them, and have always been able to go real fine in Could this area. Could you name some of those outstanding people? I would... I would, I would try, I'd rather not because I think I would probably be infringing on someone else's time and you what they want to talk about. You might be leaving somebody out. I certainly would, and I found a long time ago talking. <laughs> I'd probably <laughs> leave out my very next door neighbor's see or something <laughs> of this type. But, uh, oh, I suppose we have a small amount of uh, problems in our school uh, with uh, some of our young people getting into difficulty. But you know, they did it in my day and age. I graduated from high school in 1932, and you know we had some, we had some juvenile delinquents in that time, and and uh, I think we we have uh, the young people are 
in our community I know are real fine young people and they've got a real fine attitude and some of the things they want is not too bad. I, I think it's real fine and when things they're asking for, they're, they certainly are. They're asking for things to be told to them as it is and I don't think the truth should ever be shunned. I think it's something that we should uh, say if they want the truth, right. And uh, I don't think everything they're doing is wrong. Uh, oh, I, you know, kind of bothers me with the long hair and the beards once in a while, but actually that's not too bad. I, that's <laughs> I, outside. No, I, that's right. It's something else. But I, I think pretty generally if uh, the young people in our community are a real fine group of people, and they've already come and helped us some and worked with us on our, on our museum, and, our, and they're as interested in our heritage. Oh, okay. And the high school now is getting ready to, to organize a heritage club in the high school to be of assistance to us in our efforts. And I don't know how you can ask for any better cooperation than this. There's no generation gap in this area. Wonderful. Uh, we thank you so much for this interview. We can't infringe on your time any longer, but Mr. Higgins, it has been such a pleasure. This is uh, Mr. Uh, interview with Mr. Jack Higgins of uh, Blackwell, Oklahoma. Mary B. Robertson, we're signing off. You have something more you'd like to? Just one other thing. Uh, Mr. V.R. Easterling was uh, also the president of the school, which I attended at one time. And if he ever happens to hear this, tell him I, uh, he's still doing a very fine job. I'll see that he does, Mr. Higgins. Thank you so much.